If it were not for Quakers and evangelical Christians, slavery might still be legal in the English-speaking West today. In the modern Western world, every human being is legally free, regardless of race, heritage, religion, mental ability, or economic status, every person has the fundamental right to the self and permanent emancipation from being owned. No human being can possess another human as property. In the modern West, slavery has no grounding in society and is treated as an abomination. This freedom that many in the West take as a given was not obvious to our predecessors. Slavery has been a stain on mankind throughout the generations. From the dawn of civilization, man enslaved man, nation enslaved nation. There was little reason to believe that slavery was a vice, and perhaps even less of a reason that it could be eradicated. Just as the ancients might have thought it impossible to reach the moon, the eradication of slavery was not even considered in the realm of possibility. It was simply a part of the tragic human condition. It was only when a comprehensive, transmissible, and absolute moral framework was established did any major efforts to terminate slavery commence. The abolishment of slavery in the Anglosphere and efforts to eradicate it elsewhere would have been impossible without Christianity. Slavery has been a common institution since the beginnings of organized civilization. Tribes of hunter-gatherers and nomadic bands have no practical use as certain criteria need to be met for slavery to be a worthwhile endeavor. The practice requires a minimum population density as well as significant economic surplus. Since these bands and tribes lived sparsely and typically did not store goods in excess quantities, slavery was impractical and implausible. Slavery only became a widespread institution after the agricultural revolution in approximately 11,000 BC. The Sumerian Code of Ur-Namu, the oldest known legal code, affirms the existence of slavery as a customary practice. Another noteworthy ancient Near East document was the Code of Hammurabi, arranged in approximately 1760 BC. The code is overwhelmingly in favor of bondage, casting the death penalty on those who aid and abet a slave's escape. The Bible's stance on slavery is complicated, especially from a contemporary perspective. The law of Moses in the Old Testament makes no effort to discredit the institution, and in some cases encourages it, but makes exceptional provisions for the safety and well-being of slaves, which were revolutionary for both the time and place. For example, in contrast with the Code of Hammurabi, the Law of Moses requires that if slaves should escape from their masters and take refuge with you, you must not hand them over to their masters. Let them live among you in any town they choose and do not oppress them. However, slavery in the Old Testament was not expressly discouraged, primarily because like other cultures in the Near East, it was accepted as a common social custom. Joseph a famed biblical patriarch was sold into slavery by his brothers. While there were many restrictions and provisions on Hebrews owning other Hebrews as slaves, there were very few provisions concerning the ownership of foreigners as property. The book of Leviticus allows the Israelites to purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around them, and that they may be passed down as an inheritance. While slavery was mainstream in the ancient Near East, the Mosaic law humanized slaves and provided them with unique privileges. In addition to the aforementioned ban on restating escaped slaves to their masters, the Sabbath commandment helped humanize slaves. The third of the Ten Commandments, which prohibits Israelites from working on the seventh day of a seven-day week, and includes anyone in their households, including foreigners living among them, this signifies that even slaves deserve a rest from labor. This disrupted the common held belief that slaves were inferior to their masters as human beings and deserved to be treated as such. The sympathy towards the lowest members of society is understandable considering the story of the Exodus, in which according to the book of Exodus, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years before finally achieving their freedom. Masters who treat their slaves appropriately one day of the week seem more likely to treat them better on all days of the week. 
The New Testament makes similar assumptions about slavery in the world. The events of the Gospels take the setting of Judea, a province in the Roman Empire, an empire whose economy ran on slave labor. The idea of a society without slaves was a foreign concept to the inhabitants of that time. Jesus made references to slavery in a spiritual sense, calling those who sin slaves to sin, but he makes no comment on slavery as an institution. The purpose behind Jesus' teachings is not social reform or revolution, but a way to salvation. If a person experiences this by way of love and mercy, as the Gospels suggest, then they would not want to treat anyone, not even a slave, poorly. Jesus instructs that anyone who says he loves God but hates a brother is a liar. It's not until the epistles that instructions for slaves and slaveholders are given. Paul instructs slaves to obey their masters, and masters to treat slaves justly and properly. While abhorrent to a modern audience at first glance, the logic behind this is that good standing with Jesus is the main objective, and that can only be done through honest work, regardless of how unjustly that labor is organized within human society. Dishonest labor and poor work ethic, whether to a slave master or anyone else, is strongly discouraged in Christianity. Paul also condemns slave traders and kidnappers by grouping them in with liars, murderers, and other miscreants. The New Testament condemns the slave trade, but simply accepts the institution of slavery as a part of society, and only goes as far to provide guidelines for an ideal relationship between slave and master, but makes no attempt to dismantle the institution. Slavery has existed for millennia and knows no race, as slaves are not taken simply for the color of their skin, but for their vulnerability. People in ancient times, including first century Judea, did not possess the means to acquire large quantities of people of a different race from across the world. People of the Balkans were enslaved by other Europeans for over 600 years before the first African was brought to the Americas. And North American Indians of the Pacific Northwest raided neighboring tribes for slaves. Nonetheless, the form of slavery that has had the largest consequence on the modern West was the African transatlantic slave trade. At the beginning of that slave trade, Africa was generally controlled and governed by Africans, who frequently raided and terrorized weaker neighboring tribes for slaves. When Europeans arrived, they bought the slaves on the coast and departed. Their lack of resistance to tropical diseases made it far too dangerous for Europeans to venture inland. The average life expectancy of a European in the interior was less than one year. They only arrived on the coast with a few men and a few ships, so they were in no position to defy the stronger African slave traders. Thus, with few exceptions, the Europeans had no means of capturing slaves themselves. While oftentimes slaves were treated brutally at their destinations elsewhere in the world, many Europeans and Americans were oblivious to the horrors of their enslavement by other Africans. Even those who bought slaves typically only saw the end result. As it had been for millennia, in the eyes of the public, slavery was a fact of the world, not a question of morality. Although not slaves, Europeans had been economically subjugated as serfs to their feudal lords for centuries. Many of the aforementioned Bible verses from the Old and New Testaments were used to justify slavery. Provided there was no conflict between the practices of slaveholders and Paul's instructions for them, many Christians found no moral conflict between slavery and Christianity. What was unique to the enslavement of blacks was the quoting of Genesis chapter 9, in which Noah curses his son Ham, as well as Ham's descendants, to be slaves to his brother Shem and Shem's descendants. Although the story seems to revolve around the biblical nations of Canaan and Israel, many slave owners and supporters of slavery use this passage as a deterministic justification for the subjugation of one race to another. The British Empire began its involvement in the transatlantic slave trade during the 16th century, and across the entire history of that slave trade, it was second only to the Portuguese in total number of slaves acquired. The Church of England was the state church whose leader was the British monarch, and the mixing of church and state affairs created dissent among some Christians. One group that rose to prominence out of this dissent were the Quakers, 
a group who emphasized the idea that the presence of God exists primarily within every person, rather than in monuments, politics, or public institutions. The Age of Enlightenment had swept across Europe in the 18th century. Thinkers of this movement emphasized a scientific and materialistic view of the world and dismissed the importance of Christianity. The Evangelical Revival, or the Great Awakening, was a backlash to the ideas of the Enlightenment. What separated evangelicalism from prior Christian movements was the enthusiasm and conviction to share the gospel outside of organized religion. According to the evangelicals, the Church of England had become stale, practicing Christian rituals but without the Christian ethos. The early evangelicals, however, had little interest in abolishing slavery, and when they did concern themselves with slaves, they were generally interested in their spiritual well-being, not their enslavement. The Quakers, however, were proto-evangelical in belief and largely opposed slavery. But the Test Acts of 1673 prevented Quakers and other nonconformists from taking public office. Evangelicalism, on the other hand, was interdenominational, and they tended to align themselves with the Church of England, rather than with their dissenters. As the evangelical movement grew and matured into the 19th century, evangelicals began to advocate for social reform by referring to the Christian conscience. A point of theology which the evangelicals emphasized was the imago Dei, or the image of God. The idea that all men are created in the image of God and equal in the eyes of God. Evangelicals considered activism to be essential in eradicating the world of sin. These reforms included keeping of the Sabbath, cracking down on vice, and the abolishment of slavery. Slavery was not recognized in British common law, so few in Britain participated in slavery directly. This made abolitionism a much easier social crusade than regulating a vice or telling people what to do with their Sundays. The Clapham sect was an evangelical group within the Church of England, led by parliamentarian William Wilberforce. For over 20 years and with the help of the disenfranchised Quakers, the sect campaigned for the prohibition of the slave trade, and eventually the Slave Trade Act of 1807 was passed which ended the slave trade in the British Empire and encouraged Britain to take action to abolish the practice in other nations. Slavery, however, remained legal in the British Empire afterwards. Evangelicals, including the Clapham sect, continued to campaign for total abolition. Although Wilberforce resigned from Parliament in 1826 due to ailing health, he was a strong supporter of the movement, and eventually the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 was passed. Although temporary exceptions were given to allow slave owners a transition period, the law was fully implemented by 1843. Wilberforce's initiatives for social reform were not limited to slavery. In 1824, he was a founder of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, RSPCA. After the slave trade was ended in the British Empire in 1807, the British took to the open seas to fight slavery directly. Beginning in 1808, the blockade of Africa consisted of Royal Navy ships patrolling the west coast of Africa to intercept slave ships. In total, 150,000 Africans were freed by the squadron, and one British sailor died for every nine slaves freed. In colonial America, the Quakers became the first and most vehement critics of slavery. The United States was unique in the sense that unlike their British counterparts, colonial America was populated by many of the British religious dissenters who fled the country. While slavery was a hot topic at the country's inception in 1776, with many vehement opponents, including the Quakers, abolishing slavery at this time could have made the formation of the Union impossible. Slaveholding colonies whose plantation economies relied on slave labor would not have agreed to join the new country. In the early years of the nation, the Quakers had multiple failed attempts at petitioning Congress to end slavery. Much like in Britain, the Great Awakening, or Evangelical Revival, inspired abolitionism in the North. No country ended slavery quite like the United States did. It was almost a century after the country's inception when the debate on slavery was decisively ended by the events of the American Civil War. 
penned in 1776, the Declaration of Independence outlined that all men are created equal, and the Civil War was a fulfillment of that statement. During the conflict, one of the most popular war songs sung by Union soldiers fighting for abolition was a Christian hymn. Still an American patriotic song to this day, the Battle Hymn of the Republic sings of Jesus, with its most pertinent lines singing, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. Although there is no legal basis for slavery in the West today, and culturally it is seen to be abhorrent, slavery still exists in underground economies, as well as in other countries. Alongside the transatlantic slave trade, the other component of the African slave trade was the enslavement of Africans by Arabs. More African slaves were exported to Islamic nations than shipped across the Atlantic. Consequences of the Arab enslavement of Africans affect the world today. For example, Mauritania only abolished slavery in 1981, but its government admitted it is still practiced today, with government officials being caught holding slaves. Other Islamic countries that still practice slavery include the Sudan, Nigeria, and Benin. In addition, modern slavery remains a world issue. The efforts to eradicate both the conventional form of slavery and its modern equivalent are led by the very countries who in the past used Christian principles to abolish slavery in their own countries. These world leaders include the United Kingdom, the United States, along with most of Europe and the Commonwealth. Slavery has been a stain on mankind, and while it still exists in the shadows, it is no longer an institution accepted as a natural part of humanity. From the beginnings, Christianity took a different approach to surrounding cultures, and while it may be easy to look retrospectively and compare biblical practices to modernity, the biblical commentary was revolutionary for its day. Christianity, with a specific emphasis on evangelicals and Quakers, took that worldview of headway and campaigned for abolition. The wider Christian nations that these reformers called home took unprecedented initiatives to end slavery at home and abroad. If it were not for these Christians or their philosophical underpinnings, the fate of slavery would have been uncertain. <laughs>